Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and um, welcome to this uh, webinar, uh, A European Way to Legalize Cannabis. My name is Virginia Fiume, and I am the co-president of Humans, uh, which is a citizens' movement that, in partnership with Associazione Luca Coscioni and Meglio Legale, is kicking off this uh, one-day festival that is happening in Italy. And from a European perspective, we thought it was a good idea to start from the broader picture of the state of the art of cannabis legalization in the European Union, or the not yet <laughs> cannabis legalization in the European Union, and the um, potential of a European uh, uh, initiative or a series of initiatives on this matter. Um, the political introduction to this webinar will be done by Marco Perduca, who is the president of the Cannabis Legale Referendum Committee in Italy and also member of Associazione Luca Coscioni and Science for Democracy, who will introduce the debate. And after him, we will have uh, a structure, a series of interventions, starting from a broader perspective with Derek Bergman, Dario Sabaghi and Magdalena Tavkoska, and then a focus on, the, on different um, parliaments uh, and civil society organization at more of a nation state level. Um, for those of you that are following online, don't forget to share this live stream. There is not my, my, never enough information and quality information about cannabis legalization. So this is a very important piece of um, information and action that we are putting together today. Um, there is the translation available for those of you that are connected uh, in Zoom. So you might see at the bottom of the screen an icon with the shape of a globe, and you can pick the language of choice for listening to the, to the webinar. Um, I will introduce the speakers progressively, but uh, to start, uh, the floor to Marco Perduca for an introduction to what is happening in Italy today in Rome, but also to this um, session that we put together. in Italia, oggi a Roma, ma anche una presentazione della sessione di oggi. Okay, so Marco Perduca is trying to connect. Of course, there is not, not such a thing as a perfect webinar with no technical issues. So in the meantime, just to entertain you, um, for those of you in the Zoom, so the, the idea is to have the speakers uh, and then have some time at the end for a bit of Q&A. We will do our best to ensure this, uh, but in the meantime, of of course, you can use also the chat uh, here in the webinar and also the comments uh, on the channels where we are broadcasting the, the webinar. And we will do our best to reply to your questions or for sure to make them the grounding works for, uh, for other initiatives. Um, so in, no, 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 I don't know if Perduca managed his connection, we see him. I did, I did. And yes. we hear him. So, Marco, yeah. the floor is yours. Good afternoon, everybody. And sorry for the wrong t shirt, uh, which says LSD, but tonight we will talk <laughs> about cannabis. As Virginia said, this today's uh, um, debate will try and deepen our knowledge on what is going on around Europe uh, when it comes to necessary reforms in the field of uh, cannabis regulation, but also what can be done at the county continental level with uh, a European citizens initiative. On my way here, I was rereading the Home and Justice uh, European Common Decision of 2004, and I didn't remember that, but it was suggested in 2003 by the Berlusconi government. And so no wonder that is a document that needs some fixing or at least some updating. Uh, over the last three and a half years with Lorenzo Miner, who's next to me, in, also in person in Vienna, we have had a series of meetings with uh, non-governmental organizations, networks, experts, and people that uh, at the national level were engaged in promoting cannabis regulation reforms and also uh, were participating in side events at the UN Commission on Narcotic Drugs to try and suggest a more commonsensical set of rules and policies on the plan. Of course, everybody knows that the pandemic hit. And so for the last couple of, of years, we've been working nationally on a variety of others, uh, 
possibilities, and certainly the referendum that Virginia mentioned before was one of them, but we have seen happening around the continent little or big movements that were asking more or less the same thing. So the idea that has been in the making for quite some time and went uh, to the Humans Congress in Warsaw three months ago and had a panel dedicated to that is to finalize within, let's say over the summer, a document that addresses all um, aspects related to the prohibited or regulated plants. And the three aspects are industrial, and we say industrial, but we know that it doesn't have to be big firms that take care of this industrious labor. There can be also small enterprises or individuals that would like to grow plants for uh, other uses than just smoking it because of the percentage of THC and the percentage of CBD. We have the therapeutic as aspect that in some countries is uh, well managed, in other it isn't. Italy is a clear example of that. We have a 15 year old law that on paper looks wonderful, but after 15 years it has demonstrated to have a lot of problems, especially when it comes to providing the necessary products to people that have a regular prescription. And then of course there's the, the criminal um, level that we need to take care of because we are still running the risk of uh, being, in, if not incarcerated, certainly sent to the police or to, in Italy, we have prefects if uh, we are caught with an unreasonable amount of uh, cannabis that is not considered to be for personal use or we grow uh, a number of plants that is considered to be preparation for them dealing drugs illegally. Um, we've had meetings also last week. There has been uh, some uh, constructive criticism that has been put forward. I think today we will go around Europe with other updates coming from different countries, but, and the people that are participating and had a chance to have a look at the document. And we hope that with additional uh, views and analysis, additional viewpoints and additional criticism, we can move forward. This, uh, the uh, home and justice um, and uh, home, uh, justice and home affairs decision of 2004 is important for us at least because it was used by the constitutional court to block the referendum that we had prepared last summer. It is not within Italy's uh, law to quote that kind of international obligations to block a referendum. Not even the UN convention should be mentioned to block a referendum, but this is a story that we'll tell another time. But because it is there, and even if, as Leonardo, who is ma managing uh, live streaming today, always says, it is not necessarily in, in net, to impose criminal sanction or personal use and cultivation of cannabis, that position has not been updated since 2004. So we will have to find the best final version of the European Citizens Initiative to try and address these three levels. One is already uh, been managed by uh, the Commission on the Novel Food Directive when it comes to so-called industrial hemp. The other two is the therapeutic and the, the criminal aspects of, of cannabis remain an open question at the continental level. Why are we targeting that? Because everywhere we go, we smell cannabis all over Europe, which means that even if the law is uh, fears or, or is being relaxed, this has become part of European uh, culture. And we want to legalize that part of culture and we want to legalize nature, as they say in the United States. And I hope that today's discussion will help uh, arrive at a better version within the next few days, and then we will have other opportunities to share with you the final draft and take it from there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marco Perduca. Um, to describe to those who are listening, the European Citizen Initiative is the instrument uh, that the citizens of Europe have available to address the European Commission. In the moment we decide to launch such an initiative, we will then need to collect one million signatures in seven member states at least. So it's quite an important effort. Uh, but the idea of starting this discussion is because the um, situation is maybe mature enough to try such an effort and this webinar is part of this uh, um, progressive uh, work. So um, the next person, so the first part of the of the webinar aims to give some uh, 
general context uh, to, to the European situation. Uh, and we start with one of the countries, the Netherlands, that apparently is one of the easiest place for uh, people that uh, use cannabis, but maybe it's not exactly like that. So starting from the myth and the things that needs to be demythologized, uh, I'll give the floor to Derek Bergman uh, from Vok Netherlands, who are gonna give us the perspective from this particular country in the context of the European Union. Thank you very much, Virginia. Thank you for everybody who's working on the uh on the seminar today, on the webinar. I will try to give a, a quick rundown of the situation here in the Netherlands. So we start back in 1976, when the Dutch drug law was changed to introduce a uh, distinction between cannabis and other illegal drugs. And this distinction paved the way for our coffee shops, our famous coffee shops where you can buy uh, cannabis. The main problem was and is still that cannabis remains illegal technically and formally and production and import of cannabis products are actively prosecuted here. It is as if drinking and selling milk is allowed, but the police can shoot any cow that they see and will so. This so called backdoor problem referring to the backdoor of the coffee shop has led to all kinds of problems. There is no quality control or ingredient information for the cannabis products that are sold in our coffee shops here. It is even forbidden for coffee shops to test and have their cannabis tested at a lab for pesticides or cannabinoid percentages. Cannabis is grown in all sorts of places and sometimes under unsafe conditions. Criminal gangs have become involved in the production. And as long as cannabis remains illegal, it is impossible to put any tax on it. Uh, progressive political parties here, and the, especially a party called D66, and NGOs like the one I work for, VOC, have been advocating for further reg regulation and legalization for years now. A legalization law proposal by D66 got a tiny majority in our House of Representatives in 2017, but it has never been passed on to the Senate, so it is still in limbo. Instead, the former government came up with a limited weed experiment in 10 of the 102 cities that have coffee shops here. 10 companies will be allowed to grow cannabis for the coffee shops in these cities in a fully regulated way. None of the five biggest Dutch cities, such as Amsterdam and Rotterdam and The Hague, are taking part in the experiment. The wheat experiment is a political compromise between the two Christian parties in our coalition government that are anti-cannabis and want to close down all the coffee shops and D66, the party that wants full legalization. The fourth coalition party, led by our Prime Minister Mark Rutte, is somewhere in between. So now, more than five years after the experiment was announced, there still has now been not any harvest of regulated cannabis. After a long selection process, 10 growing companies were chosen, but they are running into all kinds of problems such as banks refusing services to them. The Dutch government expects the first regulated cannabis to be available in the second half of next year, 2023. Obviously, the rest of the world has not stood still since 2017. Legalization is spreading across the globe. Other countries do no longer criticize the Dutch cannabis policy and this foreign criticism, especially from France in the 1990s, is the main reason why the Dutch governments have been tightening our cannabis policy and making it more strict. The wheat experiment, unfortunately, slows down the tempo of change. For most coffee shops here, nothing will change in the coming years. Most consumers will still have to buy completely unregulated cannabis products, 
home growing is not part of any law proposal or political plan and home growers are routinely evicted from their house. What is happening in Germany is obviously very, very important to us, their little neighbor. We hope that home growing will be legal in Germany and that tourists will not be banned from German cannabis shops. This would set a great example for our politicians. There's always a chance, of course, that our four party government will break down before the end of its term. If this happens, this would create more opportunities for faster and bigger change in our cannabis policy. In any scenario, a European wide action would be very helpful to show our Dutch politicians how much support there is in Europe for cannabis reform. The fear of foreign critique and pressure still runs deep with a lot of politicians and civil servants <coughs> with the european citizens initiative we can assure at them that they don't have to be scared they can just go ahead and legalize the plant thank you Darik, for some encouragement words for the eu institutions uh, talking about europe and also from a bit of a broader perspective maybe um, we have with us dario sabaghi who is a contributor at forbes uh, and uh, he followed for forbes the um, referendum initiative in italy but i think he has a privileged observatory of different uh, situations in the european union so the floor to mr dario sabaghi for a bit of a perspective on the matter from a mediatic perspective as well somehow yeah uh, thank you very much for having me in this event so uh, what i want to highlight is we have to think what types of legalization we want as a european because each european country is following different kind of legalization some uh, countries are following a uh, medical cannabis legalization or they are trying to decriminalize or uh, legalize personal uh, use and cultivation and others are uh, trying to legalize uh, recreation of can cannabis sales and the european uh, scenario is uh, really fragmented uh, so far, only the Malta uh, has become the first European country to uh, legalize personal use cultivation and association of cannabis, but not sales. And uh, Luxembourg should follow this year, uh, hopefully. But all the eyes of uh, the from journalism perspective are on uh, Germany, of course, because it's on the political agenda of the so-called uh, green light, uh, uh, green light government coalition uh, that is going to should be uh, fully legalized cannabis sales in Germany, and of course Germany had a very uh, very performative uh, medical uh, medical cannabis legalization in uh, 2017 is uh, performing quite well, and so many uh, many experts. Uh, are expecting that the government should legalize uh, uh, recreational cannabis in uh, in Germany this year on early 2023. Uh, they don't have still a draft law, so we're hoping uh, they now they have some uh, hearings that will be very helpful for the government to decide what kind of a model to adopt for uh, for Germany because we have seen that. Uh, the Dutch model or the Spanish model is not working very well so far because they haven't legalized uh, cannabis sales. Also, as Mr. Perduca said, the uh, situation in Italy, where the, uh, the most uh, the most population uh, is is in favor of the legalizing cannabis, uh, the Supreme uh, the Supreme Court has recently reject a referendum that could decriminalize personal use and cultivation. And also the um, medical cannabis in Italy is, has been established since 20, 2007, but uh, the lack of supply is a suffering from a medical patients. And also uh, regarding medical patients, Spain uh, as recently, like two or three days ago, 
uh, going uh, is going forward to a bill, draft bill to uh, legalize medical cannabis, but will be uh, very limited for uh, epidiolex and sativex uh, drugs made uh, developed by uh, UK based uh, G, uh, GW pharmaceutical. And so also Spain has a paradox. Uh, there are 10 companies that are le uh, licensed for research and export cannabis, but this cannabis cannot be used for uh, Spaniards. So it's another paradox in the European uh, environment. And uh, also the Netherlands, as Mr. Bergman said, uh, is trying to uh, develop a pilot program to legalize uh, uh, um, the distribution of our recreational cannabis. And, but it has been subjected to many delays since the start of the idea to do so. And one of the major European countries, France, is still be, uh, behind the older countries, which where cannabis is still illegal, uh, illegal for personal use. And, uh, but for medical cannabis instead, um, it's going, uh, there is an ongoing pilot project that is going to involve uh, 3,000 people and that uh, suffering from a severe condition. And uh, we are going to see what's happening there. But the um, policy, the French policy, are very restrictive uh, uh, towards cannabis. And Portugal uh, is interesting because it decriminalized all drugs in uh, 2001. Uh, but hasn't no legalized uh, recreational cannabis yet, while it legalized medical cannabis, uh, cannabis in uh, 2018. But interestingly, is uh, Portugal has become a hub for Canadian and US companies that are starting to penetrate the European uh, medical cannabis market, ready when the other countries will legalize cannabis and they are ready to sell cannabis for all the European countries. And we have uh, Aurora Cannabis, Pura Leaf, uh, Casa Verde Capitals, and uh, other uh, companies. And uh, also, uh, although uh, it's not included in the, as a uh, EU member, uh, Switzerland is developing a new, uh, um, a new pilot project that will involve uh, 400 people to legalize uh, recreational cannabis there. And uh, it would be interesting to see what's going on in uh, Basilea while well, the, the pilot project, project is going to, to take place. And so, um, as we can see, we can see uh, two, uh, two threats. One is most of the country are following the decriminalization for personal use as a first step to go a uh, full legalized cannabis, uh, recreational cannabis. And there are some pilot uh, projects to, um, to try to, re, uh, to legalize recreational cannabis. So uh, in terms of if Euro, Europeans need um, an action, uh, I can tell you some that I have took note. There is a 2022 European drug record that say that 7.7% uh, of Europeans had uh, has smoked cannabis in the last year, while uh, about 27.3% of the European population uh, smoked cannabis in their lifetime. In 2020, uh, 2020 uh, European member states uh, seizured uh, like 740 tons of cannabis and ashes. These are a lot of money that uh, European countries are spending to uh, prohibit uh, cannabis and its byproducts. And it's not going to work. The uh, organized crimes are not, uh, are not giving up. They are just making money on the prohibition policies of European countries, no one excluded. And, but we have also to take in consideration we, that with any kind of legalization we have in each country of Europe, we are going to, we have to put a focus on the discouraged by um, underage people from smoking cannabis. But because as the record say, the, um, 
uh, the mean age for the first use is a 16 years old. So any legalization is going to lose that kind of range of age from uh, from putting in place of the legal perspective and uh, organized crimes are going to take that that piece of market there a market that in uh, Europe could value about like uh, about 37 billion uh, euro by 2020 uh, 2025 or 67 billion uh, euro by 2028. Uh, the, um, this number really the first by uh, the record have uh, took in consideration. And but what we can say is that five, uh, 55 percent of European uh, support cannabis legalization. So uh, although it is uh, really fragmented, the situation uh, in Europe is uh, warmly uh, suggested to take an action as uh, as a lobbying activities for uh, each movement of each state uh, to lobby for a kind of uh, process of legalized cannabis uh, for could be a recreational level or could be just um, the criminalization of for medical cannabis perspective. And uh, also um, the, 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 the fact that uh, cannabis is uh, still illegal is because of uh, the, fa uh, the failure of policy that didn't, uh, didn't happen in, a, in the place. And the US, um, the uh, United States is not going to uh, legalize cannabis at federal level in uh, the, um, in the on, in this year, but Europe could take uh, could have a look at what's going on in the U.S. states to uh, to see what kind of model they can adopt. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dario Sabagi, contributor at Forbes. Uh, and now the next intervention brings uh, the lenses of social justice and uh, cannabis legalization as a human rights matter, but also uh, the relationship between the legalization of cannabis in those states where democracy and rule of law are more in danger. Uh, I'm very happy to give the floor to Magdalena Dapkowska, which is the Drug Policy Coordinator Officer at, um, Director at uh, Helsinki Foundation for Human Rights, as well as uh, members of the Humans Board, so double happiness for having her with us. Uh, Magdalena, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Virginia. And thank you to all the organizers for invitation for today's uh, meeting. Well having so many experts in cannabis and on regulation at the national or European level gathered around this virtual table of our today's meeting, what I could offer and put on this table as my own contribution to the conversation that we are having is, as Virginia said, the human rights perspective. And this is the perspective that is often missing when drug policies are discussed, probably because it is not that obvious and the links between drug policy and human rights are not that easily visible. They do become visible when human rights violations are really brutal and evident, such as the death penalty, for example, which is a possible punishment for drugs related uh, crimes still in at least 35 countries around the world, of course, not in the, uh, in the EU. Uh, so here that link uh, may not be that um, that obvious as I'm saying. And when we think about the European Union's context and the uh, cannabis regulation uh, context, uh, what might be coming to people's minds are first uh, the freedoms that people who wish to uh, use cannabis would like to enjoy, a very legitimate uh, request and, um, and desire, or maybe the right to health, uh, to say it precisely, it is called the right to the highest attainable standards of health, uh, which should um, actually guarantee the access to affordable medical cannabis to all patients uh, who are in need of that type of treatment. But uh, what I would like to mention today are some other issues to add some other examples um, that I hope could on one hand add some human rights arguments to why we need uh, drug policy reforms in Europe, 
And on the, uh, on the other hand, I hope they could also influence our thinking about what exactly we should be calling for. Because while Europe is a relatively uh, safe region without the, the dramatic uh, human rights violations, such as a death penalty that I, that I mentioned, and while Europe is also more or less a democratic region, it is not so for everyone everywhere at the same level. And there are countries within uh, the EU, I think I do not need to list them, uh, where the democratic system and the rule of law uh, are deteriorating, and it has been so for a while already. And while we do not have too much time today to go really deep into what it means for uh, citizens, for civil society, one can more or less easily imagine, right? That, uh, that deterioration would mean less freedoms, fewer rights, uh, more control, state control over the uh, over the citizens, and also more populism as a um, as a narrative. And all these tendencies and phenomena, again, they do not have the same influence for all the citizens. They affect mostly those who are either opposing the rising authoritarianism, either have already belonged to uh, the vulnerable communities and groups, or uh, to, the, to those um, who work on issues that are perceived by society or presented to the society as morally dubious, including drugs and drug policy. So what we could already see were, for example, smear campaigns uh, and scapegoating um, that targeted uh, drug policy and harm reduction organizations in Hungary. Uh, when, when we move a little bit to the east, so outside of the EU, the, uh, the very strong and illustrative examples come from uh, Eastern European countries or even Central Asian countries, where um, opposition representatives, where journalists, where human rights defenders were targeted by being accused of drugs possession. That happened, for example, to Balot Temirov, a journalist in Kyrgyzstan, or to Oyub Titiev, the head of Memorial Human Rights Organization in Grozny. Or we could hear a, a lot about cases being reported in Russia, where police officers stab people and during the arrest they drop in some drugs to their pockets and then um, accuse people for drugs possession. So basically what is happening in a number of places is that the prohibitive drug policy is used as a very easy and useful, I'm sorry to say, tool to um, erase people, to move them to the margin, to uh, get rid of those who are somewhat um, uncomfortable and desired by the authorities or by the society. So uh, even though, as I said, these strong examples are coming from outside of the EU, I believe that a very, very serious warning to us, for example, in my home country, in Poland, uh, which uh, recently uh, in um, the Civicus Monitor, the monitoring the, uh, the rights, uh, Poland downgraded from category of narrowed to obstructed space for civil society. And at the same time, it is the country where even the smallest amount of cannabis is a crime. But now moving a little bit to the to the West, uh, where the punitive law criminalizing possession of um, of drugs of psychoactive substances, cannabis included, is also widely used against um, specific groups. This time, not necessarily political opponents or rule of law defenders, but against racial, ethnic, ethnic, or even religious minorities. I'm talking about black peoples in UK, well, that's also outside of the EU, but in France as well, or I'm talking about uh, Roma peoples in, um, in Slovakia. So even though the data clearly shows that these different groups, different ethnic groups or racial groups use uh, psychoactive substances on similar levels, we can see that some of them are targeted by the law enforcement much more than others. So data clearly shows that black and brown peoples are overrepresented in prisons and that unjustified police profiling does exist, which results as an example, again, it comes from UK. It results with young black men 
at the age between 18 and 24 years, they are 19 times more likely to be stopped and searched by the police than other citizens. 19 times. And um, even in the countries where societies are somewhat homogeneous, so uh, the black or brown communities are smaller, maybe less visible uh, on the streets, even in these countries, the drug law is still used in an unjust way. It's just, again, the question, um, who is targeted? And so it might be a young man um, in a less uh, wealthy districts of the town, uh, they would be more frequently targeted by the police than uh, middle-aged gentlemen in elegant suits in the, in the business areas of the city. So we do see that, uh, that profiling. And what is even more is that it seems that when drugs are involved, or there's even a suspicion that drugs were possessed or used, then uh, it is somewhat probable that we'll see more police brutality during the stop and search process. And it is somewhat striking that we'll also see some more tolerance and acceptance towards these practices in these cases from the society, from the uh, public uh, perspective. So what I'm trying to say and to show here that while well, human rights are universal and that uh, they equally apply to everyone, regardless um, gender, faith, uh, color of the skin, the neighbor that we live in, or um, the size of our wallets, uh, and also while well, people should be equal before the law, the current, um, the current drug policy and the criminalization of drugs possession actually creates a framework where these basic rules are violated. And prohibition, prohibitionist law may be easily used, as, as I said, as a powerful tool against unfavorable, undesired groups of society. Um, and that's, that's why, and that's one of the human rights reasons for at least decriminalization of drugs possession for personal use. But to me, this is also um, a reason why advocates uh, for regulation, both at the national level and at the European level, need to be very careful and need to, from the very beginning, make sure that the regulatory proposals they are making are really inclusive, in a sense that uh, from the very beginning they contain all these perspectives, social justice perspective, racial justice perspective, possibly gender perspective, and there might be uh, some others, because they believe that this is really crucial to assure that at the end of the day, when we finally see cannabis regulated, <laughs> everyone can equally benefit from these reforms, regardless of those specific circumstances that I mentioned before. So I would like to uh, make it my main point today. Thank you very much. And if there are any questions or a space for debate, we'll keep it for later, I understand. Thank you very much, Magdalena Rabkowska, for this perspective that is uh, um, broader and it kind of gives a framework uh, for, for the issue also on the multiple ways that it can be tackled, but how they can be held together from a from a human rights uh, framework. Um, so now we start a second phase of the webinar, uh, which is a focus on the national and European level in the parliaments. Inside the parliaments, uh, I welcome among the speakers also Morgana Daniele, MEP from Lithuania, joined us. She's going to have the floor a bit later on, uh, but also from the civil society that is advocating and trying to influence the processes uh, within the parliament. Uh, so um, Germany was mentioned quite a few times, of course, is the uh, hottest uh, country in the, at the moment in the debate. So I'm very happy to give the floor to Maria Krause, a political speaker from the organization Deutsche Anthembard, uh, who is going to give us the latest on the situation in, in, in Germany and probably starting correcting the name of your organization, because I'm famous for misspelling names. 
That's fine. Yes, uh, thank you very much. And hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Maria Krause. Um, I'm the political speaker of the Deutsche Handverband, so called the German Hemp Association. And uh, my job is actually lobbying, so lobbying for consumers. And um, well, we have the great situation that now it's not just discussing about if we legalize cannabis, but to discuss about how to legalize. So we are talking about details, uh, detailed questions like how many plants should be allowed for home growing and uh, what kind of edibles should be sold and all kinds of things. So that's great. Um, right now, um, cannabis and other substances are regulated by the Betäubungsmittelgesetz, which is the Narcotics Act. And that's subject to the health ministry. And the health ministry is actually responsible for the legalization process. And this, these weeks, the German health ministry is hosting talks with stakeholders like us, the German Hemp Association, Deutsche Handverband, on the legalization of recreational cannabis. And the whole thing is led by the German Commissioner for Narcotic Drugs, which is Burkhard Blinert. Um, so yes, right now the status is that official hearings in the German Bundestag take place. And um, well, the results of these talks will be presented at the end of this month in June. And um, they are supposed to lay the groundwork for um, the legalization strategy with the aim to present a draft law this year. Um, so what has to be done in the end is to remove cannabis from this uh, narcotic act, um, to legalize and regulate it with the Youth Protection Act and trading laws in Texas, of course. Um, so, yeah, so there is, after many years, uh, hope um, because of the Ampel, uh, or so-called Ampel Coalition, Traffic Light Coalition, the, the coalition of German's federal government. And, um, yeah, we have um, three parties there, the Liberals, the Greens, and the Social Democrats. And uh, after many years, this uh, coalition follows a more progressive and social democratic policy. So right now, um, we already have medical cannabis in Germany. Um, we legalized it in 2017. Um, but currently, only pharmacies can sell medical cannabis in Germany, but of course, to patients only. And for patients uh, right now, it's very difficult to find a good doctor, to get a recipe, to get a permission, um, to hand an application to the health insurance. So it's very expensive and it's very uh, um, complicated, but uh, the the Ampel coalition has decided to legalize recreational cannabis in November 2021, and um, the agreement says that recreational cannabis will be distributed in licensed shops. And right now, we do know that there will be specialized licensed shops, so shops that will only sell cannabis and cannabis products. Um, but we do have the really, really big problem that even though we still, we already know that the legalization comes. Excuse me. Muted. Sorry, Maria. Okay. Um, we already know that the legalization comes. Um, we still have 500 panel procedures every day against consumers. So every three minutes, a panel procedure is initiated against the consumer. They are still prosecuted. And um, there's actually no rational argument why this is still happening. Um, so and that's because, um, yeah, the law hasn't been passed yet. And there are still uh, some national and international problems that we need to solve. So problem one, is the Federal Council of Germany. Um, the upper house of the German parliament could be a legal roadblock um, because the majority of the federal states is still governed by a coalition with the involvement of the conservative party. So that's why federalism is sometimes very annoying. And um, the biggest, um, well, yeah, the problem is to pass a legalization law, we need a majority that supports this law in the federal council. 
and um, a possible solution could be to convince the Christian Democrats with the argument of financial benefits from taxes, because the health arguments, they didn't care about the health arguments. Um, and the other possible solution could be to hope that this party, the CDU, uh, won't win further elections in their federal states. But this definitely takes too long in respect of panel proceedings every three minutes. Um, yeah, so that's the first thing, uh, the first problem, the Federal Council. The next problem, or what could be a problem, is uh, the single, single convention. But in my point of view, there's actually a simple solution, um, which is to, to ignore it, to cancel it. Um, that would be a novelty in German policy, I know, but I think this is the best way to go um, for consumers because the single convention in itself is a failure. It is racist, it is inhumane, it is wrong. And um, actually there are no financial penalties or sanctions expected. So yeah, simple solution, ignoring. <laughs> And the other problem are the uh, EU contracts. That's why we are all talking here about it, because um, trading is forbidden due to the Schengen Agreement. So, um, yeah, another problem uh, with the whole federalism thing, uh, because uh, if there is a request for legalization, all countries have to agree to this request. And we do know that some countries won't agree yet. Um, so what could be a possible solution? Well, also ignoring EU law and maybe accept sanctions and financial penalties, but I think this is not a good solution. Um, debate, try to uh, gain an exception permit, um, change EU law, but this would take much time. And I don't think that we want to wait this long, or this would be a very long process at least, but uh, yeah, could be also an aim. And I think in the end, it's a matter of constitution um, because the prohibition is not just inhumane, but actually unconstitutional. And international EU law contradicts the national constitution. So our aim is um, to um, achieve a consistently legal government control cannabis market in, in Europe. And EU law actually allows to make national exceptions to protect the constitution. So a real solution would actually be a constitutional challenge on national and European level. So what's the prospect or the question that we Germans are asking ourselves is if Germany falls, will Europe follow? And um, yeah, if, if we look at other European countries, um, there is, we experience a liberal, liberalization in different European countries right now and worldwide. Um, so there is a trend towards liberal progressive policy, I think. And um, one example would be the lawsuit to the Austrian constitutional courts in Austria. Uh, Paul, the activist Paul Berger filed a lawsuit and the court has to deal with this subject at the end of this month. So maybe there will be a legalization in Austria coming soon. And uh, we German legalized activists have an eye on this too, because we do need arguments and examples to prove that the legal way is the only rational way to go. And if a national constitutional court decides that the prohibition is unconstitutional, then we, they will have to legalize it. Um, we do have also a judicial uh, constitutional review proceeding in Germany. Um, yeah, but uh, I think the file was handed in five years ago, filed by Jugendrichter Andreas Müller, juvenile court judge. And um, yeah, so if a national court determines that this law is unconstitutional, we need to achieve an agreement on a European level to allow the legal trade. So, um, yeah, I think the constitution is actually more, more important in the end. And um, as we can see, there are many other initiatives in different European countries because we all know that the prohibition is unconstitutional and inhumane. And 
only a decriminalization isn't a good solution, as we can see in the Netherlands, because we need a legal market to fight the black market and the organized crime. So the prohibition is a violation of fundamental values of the European Union, like freedom, like human dignity. It violates human rights. So yes, I think there is a need for structural continental changes, and there is a need to unite behind the science and humanism, and there is a need for European-wide action like this European Citizens Initiative. Thank you, Maria. You, okay. No, no, no. I thought you you were away. So yeah, sorry. Uh, thank you, Maria. Thank you very much. Uh, and now we move to a floor that we never covered before with these uh, European webinars that we are running for a while. I'm very happy to to give the floor to MP Morgana mm -hmm. Daniele from Lithuania, who is also a member of Unite Global Parliamentarians Network, which is a co-promoter of this uh, of this event uh, uh, today. So the floor is yours. Thank you so much. It was really interesting to hear all the all, all the presentations today. Um, I will now move you to the Eastern Europe, where the picture is a, a little less optimistic, uh, but perhaps not so bad either. So 2007 was an interesting year in Europe, where uh, as we could hear, a lot of countries moved forward with their uh, regulation uh, on, on, on drugs, on cannabis, or medical use of cannabis. But uh, Lithuania actually criminalized it for the first time. So we never had it criminalized for the 30 years uh, since our um, independence. And then in 2017, somehow it happened that we actually took one step back and possession of any quantity of any legal drug was criminalized. Uh, so what is happening now? We are trying to, to get back on track again. That is to reverse the mistake that was done in 2017. But surprisingly, it's not so easy. Uh, despite the fact that since uh, since all possession of any any quantity of drug was criminalized in 2017, the use of drugs grew, and it grew uh, by the biggest percentage ever uh, since our independence. And obviously, it's not because uh, drugs were criminalized, and so people were so enthusiastic about getting criminal record, and that's why they started using more drugs. Uh, we have other explanations as the pandemia, as, you know, psychological problems people uh, encountered and other reasons why the drug use grew. So uh, criminalization was a failure, but unfortunately the bill that we had, uh, that we voted on uh, last year in autumn, uh, that would decriminalize uh, possession of small quantities of all drugs, uh, it failed. The good news is that it failed by a very narrow margin, uh, but yeah, but it failed. So what is happening now is next week on Monday, we will have a sort of another version of the decriminalization law that includes this time cannabis and cannabis products only. Um, hopefully it will be successful, but actually what happened in the parliament was, um, it was not the decision makers, uh, that did not get the message of decriminalization or the, um, the, all the health arguments and the legal arguments and other arguments why decriminalization is necessary to, implement this shift from a legal perspective on drug use as a phenomenon towards healthcare perspective on the drug use as a phenomenon. Uh, but a lot of politicians, as we know, are dependent on their voters and the voters didn't get it. Uh, when we talk about the conservative party who are in the ruling coalition, who are our partners, we are liberals, um, they, they would say that, yes, I understand, 
I support, but I cannot vote yes, because I was elected in a county, people are against it, people don't get it, people think everyone will start trading drugs, then, you know, the world will collapse and Lithuania will turn into a drug state. So, uh, so that was the main reason why it failed. And um, my main message today, I think, is um, on the political level, uh, rational arguments and uh, arguments provided by legal institutions, by healthcare professionals, by international professionals and experts, on the decision makers level, these arguments are heard. But politicians still fail to vote uh, for this because they are afraid of the opinion of the voters. So I think um, in Lithuania, there has been a tradition for many, many years to focus a lot on the decision makers. So all the NGOs and civil society, they would chase the decision makers and try to take them to webinars, seminars and work with them and kind of coin their uh, knowledge and opinion. And the decision makers have the opinion, but they still don't vote the way we would want them to. So I would encourage much more to support civil society organizations and civil society movements, also on cannabis, also on legal cannabis, because in Eastern European countries, legal cannabis is still perceived as a disaster, as um, it's a very demonized narrative. So until uh, there is a strong movement in the civil society, uh, that attracts the um, attention of media, that starts spreading the message, that starts talking about facts. Um, all the decision makers will try to refrain the, to stay away from the topic of legalization of cannabis, although decriminalization at this point might still be possible. So more uh, support and help to those little movements that we have, civil society movements, so they can work and you know carry the flag and talk about the topic and raise the awareness when it comes at least to eastern europe because uh, because the movements are very fragile very small and they really need uh, a lot of support thank you thank you very much uh, honorable uh, morgana daniele from uh, lithuania uh, i think you raised a couple of points that are quite interesting for the work that we're developing at a european union level the first one is the narrative within the parliaments and this uh, research of consensus that MP uh, needs to feed and being fed, and fed from. And I think this is one of the reasons why uh, civil society action, like the one that we're building is important to encourage those like you to, to be even stronger uh, in your positions. And talking about the role of MEPs, now I give the floor to Ricardo Baptista later, later, uh, later, sorry, member of the Portuguese parliament and also the founder of the United Global Parliamentarians Network. Since they were also at the vigil of the debate in Italy, in the Italian parliament, I think also explaining why a network of uh, parliamentarians is important as well as a network of civil society groups and citizens, uh, your perspective is going to be quite interesting for our reasoning. Uh, thank you, Virginia, and uh, hello everyone, good afternoon. Uh, it's a real pleasure to, to be with all of you uh, just a few days ahead of the International Day Against Drug Abuse and Illicit Trafficking or World Drug Day uh, at a, an important moment in history for drug policy reform across the continent. I'd like also to especially greet uh, my esteemed colleague, uh, Morgana Hudanya, who just spoke, who is also a member of the UNITE Network. Um, we were together just recently. Uh, at the margins of the World Health Assembly in Geneva. For, for those that don't know uh, me, my name is Ricardo Batista Leite. As was mentioned, I'm a medical doctor trained in infectious diseases and uh, the head of public health at the Catholic University of Portugal. And I'm also a fourth term uh, member of parliament in my country. Uh, in 2017, I founded UNITE, a global network of parliamentarians Focusing on ending infectious disease and global health at large, we are currently present in more than 80 countries trying to transform scientific evidence into concrete policy. Uh, 
uh, being at that cornerstone that is so critical of transforming uh, scientific evidence into political action plans, into new laws, into budgets, into policy reforms, and so forth. And we see this as a, a critical aspect of our activity because the reality is parliamentarians, members of parliaments, congresses, and senates are the true representatives of the people. And we have the, the role of representing people's voice, especially or starting by those that don't have a voice, those that are in most vulnerable situations. And we are the ones that keep governments accountable or at least have that obligation, that the ones that change laws, we have the capacity to change policies and to get money where it is needed. And in that sense, uh, of course, particularly discussing the role of uh, drug policy, we have played, uh, drug policy has played a very central role in all of our activity uh, since the very beginning. And of course, the fact that we started in Portugal is uh, uh, undoubtedly one of the reasons why uh, drug policy played such an important role. This year marks the 21st anniversary of the decriminalization of all drug use in our country. And uh, so we passed the law in 2000, the year 2000, the, the law was enacted and enforced in 2001. And more than 20 years later, uh, we have seen the impact of decriminalizing uh, the use of drugs in our country uh, when it comes to not only infectious diseases, of course, with an, an enormous decrease of HIV and AIDS, for example, or viral hepatitis. Just to give you an example, uh, drug-related uh, HIV infections were responsible for around 60% of infections in the 1990s. Uh, today, uh, drug-related HIV infections is responsible for less than 2% of the total of new HIV infections in our country. We saw a decrease in terms, of course, of uh, incarceration. So we do not have anyone in jail because related to drug use. And uh, of course, this leads to a decrease in costs in terms of the justice system. And we've seen also multiple other impacts on the social side, with the decrease in drug-related crime, and also on the health side. And we have, of course, impl implemented decriminalization hand-in-hand with universal harm reduction strategies and policies that are of critical importance. It's not enough just to decriminalize. But as was mentioned before, when it comes to cannabis, we have not been as, as progressive. I would say that in many ways, Portugal has uh, lived in the shadows of its success in terms of decriminalization. We actually did legalize cannabis for medical use in 2018, but we are far from reaching where we should be, in my opinion. And uh, I'm a, you know, what many would call a conservative politician. I am center-right. Um, I try to be a bit more progressive in the conservative field. But the truth is, there is a generating consensus that is now building up. And uh, I, I believe that the work that uh, UNITE has been developing has been extremely important for this. Uh, one of the reasons or one of the ways UNITE has uh, focused on pushing for policy reform and particularly for cannabis uh, legalization and regulation has been through the creation of what we call our policy desk, which is a team of people specialized on drug policy within our team that have been focusing precisely in partnership between uh, UNITE and the UK All Party parliamentary uh, group for drug policy reform. We've been working together towards focusing on getting from evidence to policy in certain countries where we see low hanging fruit, concrete opportunities, and no doubt that Portugal is standing there front and center. We foresee that um, in next September, we will start the discussion more seriously with concrete proposals for legalization. Uh, for personal use and regulation of the market in uh, September this year. And I foresee that over the next year, uh, year and a half, we will see legalization of cannabis for personal use in our country. And this will be extremely important because going back to decriminalization, 
one of the advantages was, unlike what many people said, and I, I fully hear what Morgana Daniel was mentioning, at the beginning in the year 2000, people were saying, if you decriminalize drug use, Portugal is gonna become a drug haven. Actually, we see that the rise of usage of drugs across the European continent has not been followed at the same pace as in Portugal. So we are seeing a, a rise following the trend in Europe, but that rise is below the speed of rise of the rising of consumption that we're seeing across Europe. So decriminalization did not lead to, to higher consumption rates. Actually, it led exactly to, to the opposite. There is one exception, and that exception is cannabis consumption, which has skyrocketed. And the truth is, uh, we are seeing products in the street that have very low quality. Some of them actually present themselves as health hazards in an unregulated market. These are the risks that you take. Moreover, especially young people, when buying from the black illegal market, knowing that dealing with the uh, pushing people to the margins of society to get access to cannabis is leading them to then be at higher risk of having contact with other potentially uh, damaging products uh, that are being sold in an unregulated way. And so I think the evidence is more than clear. We're, we're speaking to the converted here. The war on drugs failed its purposes. And so we need to address this issue from a scientific perspective. I must say, as a medical doctor, I was trained about the risks of cannabis use. I was very skeptical. And it, became to a point, it came to a point for me when I saw so many countries legalizing that I decided that I needed to go in depth and understand the pros and cons of legalization from a scientific, scientific perspective. And I published a paper in 2018 in an international medical journal actually presenting those arguments from a public health perspective. And I came up to the conclusion and changed my initial stance to push for regulation and legalization. And I then presented a proposal based on those ev that evidence for my party to, to support such an initiative, which it did. And so I believe that Portugal is on track. I believe that UNITE is doing what it can and hopefully can do more in the future to continue to push science into policy. And together we can build the alliances needed to make sure that we keep our populations safer and that we have more and more uh, focus on health and well being and abandon completely the judicial and criminal approach to drug, which has failed completely. But of course, the role of parliaments and parliamentarians is not enough. I know my, my time is coming to an end. And so I'll, I'll end by just saying that there needs to be stronger popular uh, support behind reforms, not just from parliaments, but from the people. And that's why I see, for example, the European Citizens Initiative as such an important initiative that highlights exactly where public opinion stands. Uh, and as you can imagine, this is extremely important for decision makers to feel we, that the people have our back when pushing forward on these, on these issues. And so it is only through fostering these alliances that we can find a European and hopefully a global way uh, to legalize cannabis in a regulated way, and putting science and public health first and making sure that human rights are at the core of all of our actions. And so as we like to say in our organization, it's time to unite in the name of the people. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. MP Lete. Uh, also because you really created the assist for the uh, last live intervention, which is from Natalie O'Regan. We will now fly to Ireland uh, and we, beside the update of the state of the art of cannabis legalization in Ireland, we will have a look of, of another instrument of participatory democracy that might be thrown into the game, which is the um, citizen assembly and the randomly selected citizen assemblies process, which uh, uh, somehow also seems to reconcile some of the elements that we brought here today. So uh, how citizens, experts, uh, and the element of expertise and science can fed up, fed a debate uh, that then feed uh, progressive decisions into, into parliaments and create more Mr. Later, where you start from a position then you go through science and uh, you might realize that cannabis legalization is the way uh, to go. So thanks, Mr. Leite, and uh, the floor to Natalie O'Regan, uh, Drug Policy Research in Ireland, and one of the first supporters of this project of the European Citizen Initiative we're working on. 
Thanks very much for having me. Um, I will try to speak slowly. In Cork in Ireland, we speak very, very fast. Um, like many other countries, our drug law is governed by a piece of legislation that is out of date. It was introduced in 1977. Um, to give you an idea, in 1977, divorce was illegal. Women were not allowed to own property. Seatbelts and cars were not a thing. Um, and I think the Atari came out the same year. So it's a pretty old piece of legislation in Ireland. Um, there has been attempts in the past to move the conversation forward. We had our first one in 2013 with a legalization bill. Um, as you can imagine, it didn't get very far at the time. Uh, we had a long running fight for access to medicinal cannabis. Uh, this was spearheaded by a mother of a child with severe epilepsy who to get access to cannabis walked from Cork to Dublin, which is, I don't know, three, four hundred kilometers. Um, she did eventually get access to it. And after five years of being promised a program since 2017, we had in November 2021, the first patient to get access to medicinal cannabis. So it has been a long, long fighting road for Ireland. So we have been criticized, like even our medicinal cannabis aspect has been criticized as it only applies to three very limiting conditions. So in terms of legalization and our cannabis journey in Ireland, uh, our politicians are very fearful of the conversation. Uh, their fear of losing voters on a very divisive topic. So since the foundation of the state in the Republic of Ireland, we have had the same two parties that have been in constant power for 100 years. Um, which has left very limited options for activists and reformists to try and open the conversation and try to engage with politicians. Um, it's the same two parties and their stance has always remained the same, which is no. Uh, nevertheless, our Taoiseach, one of our Taoiseachs at the time, our Prime Minister, uh, he admitted to consuming cannabis. Our Minister for Health has openly stated he believes that cannabis should not lead to a criminal conviction and should be a health issue. But in reality, it has led to no change whatsoever. Uh, we did have one political party that was quite liberal on the conversation of cannabis, which is the Green Party. And they did advocate for Amsterdam, Amsterdam style coffee shop policy for cannabis. But they were elected into government in early 2020, and that has disappeared off the agenda. So the one promising aspect that we do have in Ireland is a is an avenue called a citizen's assembly. So what a citizen's assembly is, it's a random choice of 100 registered voters from across different demographics and different electoral areas. And the goal is to represent uh, the overall electorate in the country. So what happens is they go up to a hotel, they sit in a big, huge conference room for a few days and they hear evidence, they hear speakers, they, they hear both sides, good and bad. Um, and at the end of it, they sit down, they discuss it between themselves and they make recommendations to our government. So we have had these citizens assembly on previously very divisive topics in Ireland. So one, we had a citizens assembly on abortion. Uh, we had citizens assembly on uh, gender issues, equality. We have currently one on biodiversity. Um, and we do we did have a promise of a citizens assembly in 2022. This has now been pushed back and pushed back. And every time you have the conversation, the date is getting further and further and further away of when a citizens assembly on drugs is going to happen. So it has been promised in the program for government. So we are just waiting on it. So the last update was the citizens assembly on drugs is supposed to happen in early 2023. Usually these kind of things, they might take nine months to 12 months to hear the evidence, write the report and submit the report to government. So 2024, by the time the Citizens Assembly will have their recommendations on the future of our drug policy available. We are due an election here in Ireland in 2025. So we can imagine politicians that are terrified of the conversation of drug policy and terrified of the conversation of cannabis are not going to make any big moves in the area one year before they're going to get re-elected. Um, they don't want to deal with the divisive issue. They would rather close the door and wish that all activists and cannabis reformers just went away and left them alone, but thankfully we don't. So 
given that it's going to be 2025 before anything comes from the citizens assembly process i think the the european citizens initiative is a fantastic way of bypassing small local poli politics and small minded conversations that are polit that our politicians have they don't want to hear this conversation at all so by having a avenue such as a European citizens initiative that we can go directly to Europe, we don't have to constantly try to get through to our politicians to bring this issue to Europe, we can bring it ourselves. And I think politicians, everybody here that's in the space, we've all heard the argument from politicians, oh, we can't, we cannot do that because of international law, we cannot do that because of European law. Well, international law has changed recently descheduling cannabis international law is moving forward to the 21st century and i do believe that european law can do the same so i think once we remove the barriers for politicians to say no under european law then they will have no excuses it is purely down to their down to them and the burden will rest on their shoulders for change so i think the european citizen initiative is absolutely fantastic um like in ireland i think we need around 10,000 signatures it's a big ask, but thankfully I have a very, very loud voice and I do not stop talking. So hopefully I will annoy plenty of people and not 10,000 people now, but I, I will try my best to speak to 10,000 people and get 10,000 signatures to make it happen. So thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to speak and to, to show how Ireland can try and help in this process of a citizens initiative. And we're very thankful for the opportunity to get involved. Thank you very much, Natalia Reagan, um, also for starting to trigger a conversation on how many different strategies uh, are needed to, to, to make the change happen in something that uh, is across Europe uh, complex but possible, so on the edge of possible. So the goal is to make it, uh, uh, to make it real. Um, so the, the webinar is supposed to finish at five. We have one last intervention, which is a video intervention from a European perspective on, on medical cannabis. Uh, is a bit long, so before showing the video, uh, I don't know if Perduca agrees with me, but maybe does anyone have uh, quick remarks on what had been said? I mean, let's use the people that are live uh, with us for maybe some quick reactions if you have, and then we will close the webinar with the video of the um, MEP, um, sorry, sorry, Ajus Saliba from Malta, also a member of the United Global Network who sits in the uh, European Parliament and is prepared for us some updates on the front of uh, medical cannabis at EU level. Uh, but I'm taking notes if someone has remarks, quick reflections, uh, something that is burning. I think there were two questions in the, uh, in the chat, or one was a request uh, of the figures uh, shared in the interview speech before, if you go back to uh, Mr. Sabagi. And then another one is the problem uh, of cannabis linked to the way of consuming it, combustion and mix with nicotine, but not everybody speaks uh, um, cannabis with tobacco. So I guess what we are trying to address here is the way in which cannabis could be regulated. So I'm not sure we want to regulate up to that point. We want to take away prohibition and as mentioned over and over again, and I totally agree. I couldn't agree more with Maria when she speaks about prohibition as a set of laws that violate human rights at all levels. So I think the, the, the debate today is at a different level. So I don't see any other uh, requests. So I see unless, an end from okay. Mr. Good. Ermanno Galli. If you can maybe keep your question short, so we try to address it, and then we show the video of uh, uh, the Maltese MP. Yes, thank you. I'm very happy to um, participate to this uh, meeting. And um, it's not very, uh, it's, it's really very important uh, about the question of uh, liberalization and uh, anti prohibitionism. But on my point of view, the most important uh, um, thing uh, is the uh, signal about uh, the narrative that uh, some intervention before us in Ireland that. Uh, uh, is the point on my point of view uh, about the uh, information 
we need uh, more effort on uh, people information uh, about uh, the reality on uh, weed on uh, cannabis uh, that is really different from uh, the um, uh, narrative that is uh, very diffuse and uh, so uh, is not uh, uh, so diffused uh, the damage that can uh, done can be done from uh, alcohol to human people to human being and uh, a really strong uh, narrative about the damage that could be related with cannabis. That is not true. This is only my point of view. Thank you very much. Thank you for this. Um, I'm going to share in the chat, or maybe Jessica can help me, the link to the Science for Democracy and Associazione Coscioni uh, podcast platform. Uh, we already have a lot of content in Italian, and one of the ideas that we are working on to foster the network of people at the EU level that are going to commit to the uh, European Citizen Initiative is to have maybe some episodes of a podcast in English that can help us to strengthen our networks and also this discourse. I see Marco Perduca hands, so Marco. No, I only wanted to react. Of course, if the European Citizens Initiative is going to start, we will elaborate a series of, uh, I would say, counter-propaganda uh, information because we're not talking about narratives here we've been bombarded for the last 50 years of the same messages that do not pose any other threat than the the the, the, the volume of the voice that is uh, distributing them around the world so they have absolutely no element i think today we have already collected enough information to prepare uh some slides also on with critique because what we heard about the netherlands about portugal are in part in conflict with the reputation that both countries have when it comes to specific situations so uh, we will develop in the moment in which this european citizens initiative is ready a series of uh, uh paper or position paper certainly but also uh, slides to counter fake news because it's true that uh, to have a public debate of a certain quality we have to provide as much information as possible. Um, thank you Marco Perduca. One last invite for live comments. Uh, otherwise we had to work the conclusion with the video from uh, Brussels slash Malta. Uh, keeping an eye on the participants, asking for help from the Team. Okay, so um, we're going to broadcast the videos from MEP Aju Saliba. I really want to thank uh, all the speakers that uh, uh, intervened today, who are not, who are not only speakers, but actually practitioner experts. So thanks to Derek Bergman, Dario Sabaghi, Magdalena Tapkowska, uh, Marie Krause, Morgana Daniele, Riccardo Battista Leite, and Natalia Regan. Of course, thanks to uh, Marco Perduca and Marco Cappato, who uh, were with us, and Associazione Luca Coscioni, Humans, and uh, Science for Democracy and Medio Legale for the production. And thanks for those of you who followed online. Keep um, following our organizations because this is just a start. Uh, and now the video from the European Parliament for a bit of hope and encouragement from Brussels. Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank you for organizing this important and the had very timely webinar that intends to provide a platform to European legislators, activists to discuss and assess the state of play on the cannabis reform in Europe. The therapeutic properties of medicinal cannabis applications are increasingly being acknowledged by the scientific community. Scientific evidence as well as patients' experience show that medical cannabis is effective in the treatment of several diseases, several conditions including epilepsy, multiple sclerosis, fibromyalgia, and can be employed in alleviation caused treatments of certain ailments including cancer. However, the regulatory framework of medicinal cannabis remains fragmented, fragmented across our European Union. Consequently, patients are not benefiting from fair access to safe, high-quality cannabis-based medication. Moreover, pan-European research on medical cannabis remains largely underfunded and the medicinal cannabis industry is not put in the conditions to develop smoothly across the European Union. 
the fragmented reality within the European Union is contributing to creating structural walls of discrimination and access barriers to enjoy one of the basic human rights, the right to health. And that is why EU harmonization on standards of medicinal cannabis products and of the national law frameworks should be a priority for European lawmakers. And I strongly believe that as a harmonized approach to a legalized and regulated medical cannabis market will definitely improve patients' fair access to medicinal-based cannabis. This regulation of cannabis-based medicines would also translate into additional revenue for public authorities that would limit also the black market and ensure that quality and, the, and accurate labeling is also established. It would also limit minors' access to the substance, which, in my opinion, is essential. Please allow me to introduce some actions that have been taken at EU level in order to ensure that patients fair access to medicinal cannabis in the EU member states. During the pandemic, a cross-party interest group on medicinal cannabis was established at the European Parliament by a group of MEPs, including myself, aiming to promote the interest of patients and medicinal cannabis value chain towards European policymakers and society at large, and also to promote a joint policy effort ensuring patients fair access to medicinal cannabis in all member states. The interest group gathers MEPs from different political parties and aims to pursue its overarching goal, that of addressing the different elements that give rise to the current obstacles that we have experienced and that are still being experienced by patients and also the rest of the value chain. In our work, we focus on four core aspects, which are a prerequisite for progressing to other more specific priorities. First of all, we need to ensure that a set of harmonized definitions are created in the field of medical cannabis. This is why during the events organized by the interest group, we foster a dialogue, a dialogue between EU policymakers and the medicinal cannabis value chain, especially patients, as well as also the scientific and our medical communities. Moreover, our interest group is also providing for a channel to stakeholders to engage in input and views contributing always to a patient-centered policymaking, which is also in line with the ongoing work of the European Commission and the Herbal Medicine Product Committee on a glossary of terms related to medicinal cannabis. Another action that has been done by the European Parliament was the adoption of the resolution on the use of cannabis for medical purposes, which is calling for a legal definition of medical cannabis in order to clearly distinguish it from other uses. Secondly, in order to follow up the European Parliament's resolution, we must also see an increase in the allocation of EU funds on medical cannabis research. The current EU-funded programmes, such as Horizon Europe and the eu for health programme, provide opportunities to promote research on medical cannabis in the treatment of many conditions. In this respect, our interest group will continue to push on the Commission to support and promote research and innovation opportunities for medical cannabis. Thirdly, the engagement of patients in policy making is absolutely crucial. In this respect, our interest group supports a patient-centered approach to policy making by facilitating the interaction between EU policymakers and patients, bringing forward patients' needs and also their interests. Last but very crucial aspect is the promotion of a stigma-free narrative on medical cannabis. In this respect, our interest group will engage and initiate a conversation to steer a new positive discourse around medical cannabis. It will involve stakeholders from all parts of the value chain, as well as policymakers, as well as civil society, shedding light on the many misconceptions that are still linked to the use of medical cannabis medicines. It is essential to ensure that no medical cannabis patient feels discriminated and thus afraid to ask for access to medicinal cannabis treatment. Moreover, the stigma-free narrative 
must also be applied to our doctors, ensure that they are allowed to use their professional judgment in prescribing cannabis-based medicines. When effective, these medicines should be covered by health insurance schemes in the same way as any other type of medicine. As representatives of our respective countries or stakeholders in the medical field, we have a common duty, a common duty to strive towards a system which places the well-being of patients, the well-being of consumers at the very helm of each decision that we take, thus ensuring availability, ensuring accessibility, and ensuring also affordability. Furthermore, I strongly believe that it is also important that accessibility, that affordability are ensured throughout a system which facilitates the application process and also safeguards patients from unnecessary bureaucratic hurdles and delays, sets guidelines for prices and also promotes a system that stabilizes prices and introduces a possibility for medical cannabis patients to purchase medicinal cannabis directly from the EU company cultivating cannabis flowers and also manufacturing cannabis oil. To conclude, I would like to stress that as more and more people are realizing the benefits that medicinal cannabis can bring to patients with different conditions, with different illnesses, it should not be the European Union regulations that stop these individuals from getting the help that they need. There is still much to be done, but the positive steps forward have already been made, including the launch of the cross-party interest group on medicinal cannabis at the European Parliament, which will definitely ensure that the unneeded administration hurdles are eliminated and that we can offer as much better services to those patients who need this type of medication. We must all play our part and be the voice of these patients who want nothing more than what they are owned with the basic, basic human rights. Thank you. Told you there were good news from the European Union. Very nice. Uh, so maybe Marco Perduca, they want to see what's happening in Rome. So if there are Italians following, I think uh, online, the next part of the program is going to be available on Associazione Luca Coscioni. No. So Perduca. No, on a page that's called E ora di legalizzare le droghe, which is managed by the uh, Luca Coscioni Association. So this afternoon, there's going to be. Uh, panels from 6 p.m. to midnight or midnight there's going to be a dj set managed by a member of parliament that will address uh, a lot of stuff that has to do with cannabis cultivation uh, classes uh, therapeutic cannabis criminal uh, penalties there is also some lawyers that will help people that may have a problem with the justice then we will have a two-hour session with members of parliament that yesterday voted amendments on a bill that would regulate home growing of four plants and have lessened the penalties also for for a small quantity dealing of small quantities from four to two years which will not automatically fetch a criminal charge and then uh, later on there's going to be uh, debates there's going to be readings uh, by um, uh, the novelists that will read more important novelists, I should say, <laughs> writings on, on drugs in general. And then there's going to be music and dancing and networking because uh, what was voted yesterday by the Chamber of Deputies will reach the plenary on the 29th, which is uh, the day after the government and the United Nations will uh, publish their national or uh, annual drug uh, report. And so it's going to be interesting to see what the Italian government and even more the United Nations will see, will say about drugs and how the members of parliament deal will react. We know that the moment in which we, this will go through by the lower chamber, and it's possible that we'll go through not without some hiccups here and there, the Senate is a different story, but uh, little by little, I think, as we have heard today, things don't happen overnight. We've been pushing for the last 35 years, so maybe the time would be ripe. But nevertheless, we know how politics is done. So thank you again, Virginia. Thank everybody. We'll, we'll, we'll be in touch. I think some of the suggestions that were 
uh, circulated today may also be asked in a, in a written format. Uh, Leonardo, who's also the director of a website that's called For Il Luogo, and is also the editor of the same uh, um, uh, column that happens uh, to be published by the Italian communist newspaper, but they're very uh, libertarian on this issue that's called Il Manifesto every Wednesday. Uh, is interested in having the pieces about the Netherlands, Poland, Germany, Lithuania, and Portugal. So we will, there was going to be a way to keep on educating each other of what's going on in Europe. This time they will be translated into Italian, but I'm sure that there will be other opportunities in the future. For now, that's it. Thank you, everyone. Oh, on the 26th, there's actually, as it was said before, it's International Day Against Narco-Trafficking and Drug Abuse. We have uh, a movie festival that will start this year. And we encourage other countries to try and replicate the same exercise. Because if we want to reach out to the general public, there's plenty of movies that talk about drugs, not necessarily about narcos, but there's a, there are other aspects of the related to, to drugs that can be used. And in, there is uh, certainly um, a, a way to keep on doing this. Uh, Sunday, there's going to be also a panel before this. Uh, the title of the movie festival is Danno Zero, which we'll not translate. We like playing on with words in Italian. So. But it means no harm or zero harm, but it also has to do with the fact that this is the first year of the, of the festival. There's another question, but we keep it for next time. We have to go and inaugurate a murales dedicated to a friend of us that, that passed away a month ago. He was a, can a therapeutic cannabis advocate and he died not because, uh, of course, he didn't get enough uh, cannabis, but he has a very rare disease. But for the last four years, he has been the champion of medical cannabis and eventually also of cannabis for other purposes. So his name is Walter De Benedetto and we're going to now inaugurate this huge murales that you can see on our uh, 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 social media channel as of tonight. Ciao. Thank you. Ciao. Goodbye. Auf Wiedersehen. Thank you.